Friday, the 13th of March, I heard that all theaters, movie theaters, had to be closed. And um, during the weekend, we, I just had the feeling that we have to do something. And what I think it's really interesting is how uh, someone from the private sector took initiative to help the artists and especially the independent artists. Good Practices, a podcast about municipal response to COVID-19 from Connective Cities. Welcome to this episode of Good Practices, a podcast about municipal response to COVID-19 from Connective Cities, the platform for promoting an international exchange of experiences among urban practitioners. My name is Daniela Marzavan. In this podcast, we get to know different practical examples from urban practitioners from all over the world who develop measures to tackle the challenges posed by this pandemic. Co-host by my side is Beate Stender. Hello. She is a journalist from Berlin, and together with the Connective Cities team, she has researched the stories. Hi, Beate. I'm very curious to get to know today's story and the good practice uh, you have found in the middle of Berlin. In the middle of Berlin, yes. Today we speak about a good practice from Berlin. That's right. And that's the city where I'm from. It's my hometown. And this is the protagonist for our episode. My name is Armin Berger. I founded a company named 3PC 25 years ago, and we are specialized on digital solutions. Um, we do websites, apps, and everything around that. And we are in Berlin at Oranienplatz, nearly 100 people working on a lot of projects. As we can hear, Berger is coming from the field of technology. And this is super interesting because the challenge we speak about today comes not from the field of technology. It comes from the creative scene, from the creative economy in Berlin. We all know Berlin is worldwide known for their creative scene and their big creative output in in music, in theater, in film, in art. And when the lockdown started in Berlin on March 14, this lockdown had a huge impact, especially to all of the artists. I remember on the Friday, the 13th of March, I heard that all theaters, movie theaters had to be closed. And um, during the weekend, we I just had the feeling that we have to do something to kind of fight this situation. And my partner and I, we kind of ma- came up with an idea uh, while we had breakfast. <laughs> we thought, okay, since we do uh, digital platforms, why not um, establish one that, that helps in this situation? So the best ideas uh, come over food. That's clear by now. (laughs) That's part of the good practice, that's for sure. And also they come from necessity and from from crisis, I think. Um, Berlin is a creative city and one of the most important creative cities in the world. And um, I think this is going to be really inspiring for other cities that have this this smaller artist um, community that are independent artists that do not rely on on public funding um, and on on help from from uh, public um, institutions that really struggle in this lockdown uh, and what I think it's really interesting is how uh, someone from the private sector took initiative to help um, the the artists and especially the independent artists. That's true. And um, I think one of the main aspects of this story is how fast he reacted. So we decided, why not write an email to Klaus Lederer and ask him whether he's interested to yeah, fund this, uh, this idea. And uh, I think, I don't know, I don't remember, did we send it on Sunday or Monday? But at the end on Monday... That was really fast, you know. He wrote back and said, yeah, okay, that's good, great idea. We are, you know, supporting this. And on Tuesday, he arranged, a, he, had, he has a big network, of course, you know. He arranged a, a big fo- uh, phone conference uh, about Berliner life. I think, I don't know when we came up with the name, maybe we had it on Tuesday. And uh, there were many institutions that are working in this section in, in Berlin were connected, the RBB, uh, uh, Music Board and others, uh, Kulturprojekte. And um, we had this phone conference and uh, we agreed on doing it. We, uh, we told everybody how, what, we, what our plan is and uh, 
they supported us, they agreed in supporting us, and we started. You know, on Tuesday and on Saturday we were done and online. <laughs> so, so it's important to know the really the days, uh, the uh, weekdays, because that was so fast. Yeah. Wow. That was so fast. I mean, we have to. I think we have to summarize this. On Sunday, they had breakfast. No, when was the lockdown? I think you need to you need to tell us when was the lockdown. The lockdown started on Saturday. Oh. Saturday, that was March 14. And on Sunday, and the next day, he had breakfast and they decided, okay, let's do something. They wrote the email. Klaus Lieder reacted on Monday. On Tuesday, they got started. On Friday, they were done. So what they built was a platform. They called it Berlin Alive. And how is it possible to build a platform from scratch in only three working days? Well, he, I mean, Berger got a lot of support. First, he got the support of Klaus Lederer, as we could listen to. The financial support, right? He got the financial support and, well, he contacted all the media people. He contacted all the relevant press offices. And so he was really the one who was pushing it to the, the whole crowd, you know? There was a second thing that uh, he was supported by. I mean, Berger told me he just needed a handful of people. He needed someone for the back end, someone for the front end, or a designer, someone who was communicating to the artists, and a project manager, and that's it. You know, just five, six people. And of course, I mean, he's running this company, and so he has this professional staff. So, sure, they had to, there were these two things. He had someone who was distributing it, paying for it, and then he had the professionals who were very quickly available to him. So we see how important it is to create this public-private partnerships in times of crisis because you can react really quickly um, and you know who are the right professionals and the right people to implement your project in real time. Exactly. And I think we should have a look to what they were building. At the end, it's a very simple platform where, where all the content is user-generated. So we only have a very small editorial uh, department that is involved in all this. All the content comes from uh, users uh, that publish live streams. That's the basic idea. And uh, one part of this um, platform or an, a basic idea is that it's very uh, lean, very slim, you know, not too much technology involved and that it's in general, very open for everybody to use it. You know, it's a little bit like a playground. <laughs> okay, now I understand how they could pull it up with only five people because the content was generated by the artist. Exactly. And we should go on and listen to Amin Berger how the streaming platform works. Okay, the whole streaming happens outside of the platform. So you have to choose whether you want to stream it through over uh, YouTube, over Facebook or whatever, or your different streaming uh, platform. It's completely open. You decide what, what you want to do. And then the thing is that you can um, uh, describe your project in our, on our platform. Uh, you can publish uh, some designs, some photos or whatever. And since it's all about live streaming, you have to choose a, a date and a time and you publish this and that's it, you know. It's very simple. Yeah. It's at the end low tech and we don't support, uh, we have uh, FAQs about how to stream and all that, but all this streaming happens outside of the platform. Yeah, I think these are one of the main aspects of this platform. You cannot stream directly on the platform. The platform links you to other streaming services. In a way, it's a meta platform. Yeah. And um, yeah, okay, I get it now. Let's listen to how Armin Berger is describing it. At the end, it's a calendar for live streams. And the funny thing about it is, if you, if you think about it, it's so little. The, the thing it does is so little, but that's the missing part because there are live streams everywhere in the world. There are millions, trillions all the time, of course, you know, but you don't see them, you don't find them. And it's so simple that this little thing brings it all together. And uh, f I mean, we had times we had more than uh, nearly 800 live streams on our platform, you know. And everybody would think, yeah, you, you have to set up the infrastructure and the payment and all that stuff. It's true, but I think it's sometimes it's important to see what's there and use that and see what's not there. And the thing that is not there is this, con you know, one single 
point of contact and you can see all the live streams that are available in Berlin. I think it's a great service, especially for the citizens, for the end users that really want to enjoy concerts um, and enjoy uh, artistic expression in times of lockdown. But I was wondering, how did they manage to support the artists? That's a good question. In this case, they worked with a donation system. Right away at the, from the beginning, we started with a button uh, that made it possible to donate to the artist. And now we have uh, added a, an extra service that's called a Soli Ticket, Solidarity Ticket or something like that, where you can choose what you want to uh, pay. Since you choose, the artist chooses um, the streaming platform, Everybody is free to choose a uh, streaming platform that offers pay-per-view, you know. But then we are not involved in this. We are not part of this. It's not part of our platform, the payment, you know. We don't make any money with it. No, it's... it's uh, but on the other side, you know, you don't need a lot of... Once it's established, more or less runs by itself. You don't need to do a lot, you know. Uh, which I like, you know. It's, it's like you give something to the community... And they do whatever they want to. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it's remarkable how he says uh, it runs by itself. You don't need to do anything. Um, because very often um, in, the, in the private sector, you see people not realizing the resources they have and the knowledge they have. And I'm pretty sure that if a municipality would set up such a platform, they would need pretty, pretty much a lot of work and a lot of financing to do it. Um, so to me, it's a really nice example of how cities, municipalities, and generally the public sector should rely much more on the private sector on the on the capabilities and resources that are there just available and also on this will and desire of the private sector to to make something significant for their community to donate their time to donate their knowledge and to do this voluntary work especially in times of crisis that's true but we have to mention that in this case the municipality was working together with Armin Berger. I mean, it was the he got the first big yes. input from Klaus Lederer. Of yes, course, if yes. if if he hadn't been supported by him, I think it had been also for Armin Berger more difficult yeah. to set a platform like this. It would have been just another private initiative that doesn't get traction. So it got this amazing traction through the support of the of the Berlin Senate. Um, I wonder what did they do to to keep this model simple and sustainable and also accessible to people who are maybe not digital savvy enough to dive in automatically and, and understand quickly how it works. Uh, very often people make the mistake that they want to, you know, if they establish a platform like this, that it has to include everything. You know, I believe that, you know, technology evolves so fast, it doesn't make sense to establish. I mean, in this case, we didn't have time to do it anyway, in a, in a different way. Um, but still, it, it does, does not really make sense to um, set up your whole infrastructure yourself, because it will be obsolete in, in half a year, maybe, you know, because something new uh, uh, pops up somewhere else. So I think it's very important to find uh, simple, lean ways, you know, to use all the stuff that is already there, you know. Uh, well, I think for most municipalities, it can be really interesting as a takeaway that if you want to create this digital one-stop shop for live streaming of cultural events or even for other municipal services maybe, it's really important not to try to make the perfect, uh, most elaborated uh, digital platform that will take months, you know, to, to have all the specification correctly, but actually to use what is out there and to be really citizen-centric. So if they already use something, then take that and create the meta platform that connects all of that. So keep it simple and make it simple. And also technology evolves so rapidly that you will have to adapt anyway. So use this adaptiveness and this agility that comes with software and with technology and um, implement it in your, in your thinking as well. Um, so What I, what I really um, appreciate about this project is that it shows us how quickly you can 
implement such an idea if private sector actors and public sector actors work together hand in hand and everyone brings all their resources and capabilities on the table and work for the same goal. This was Good Practices, a podcast about municipal response to COVID-19 from Connective Cities. My name is Daniela Marzavan, and I was talking with the radio journalist Beate Stender about Armin Berger's good practice in Berlin. Producer Beate Stender, executive producer Daniela Marzavan. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you'll be back for our next episode. Stay safe and goodbye. This podcast was brought to you by Connective Cities, the international community of practice for sustainable urban development. A joint venture between the German Agency for International Cooperation, the Association of German Cities, and Engagement Global Service Agency Communities in One World. Commissioned by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development.